Welcome back to SuperCloud 22. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here at Palo Alto for our big event, SuperCloud 22. We've got a great ecosystem conversation here. Ramesh Prabhagaran, who's the co-founder and CEO of Promisio. Ramesh, great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, John. So I wanted to bring you in because we had previous CUBE conversations around cloud networking latency. You also have uh, some, some pedigree, Viptela, for the folks in the industry know that's been uh, a deep tech company. Yep. You have been around the block. You've seen the movie before. You've seen the tech trends. You've seen the hype. You've seen the fluff. Where's the meat on the bone with SuperCloud in your opinion? So, uh, it, it starts with what enterprises are struggling with, right? Um, and if you take a very simple example, it's actually quite fresh in my mind because I was just having this conversation this morning. A large bank has an application sitting in AWS, right? And they have to provide the application access to the treasury, to their suppliers, to ticker feeds, to all their downstream uh, uh, partners, and, and so on and so forth. Guess what, they don't control where all those things are. They're in very different regions, very different clouds, and so you, whether you like it or not, you have a problem here, right? And so it starts with, for the particular bank, what are the capabilities that they need, right? And so uh, AWS provides a whole host of uh, native capabilities, but they still need to build a few more things on top. So going by essentially the definition of super cloud, even within a single cloud, you need to build a few more capabilities on top. That gets worsened by the fact that now you need to provide access to various other clouds, various other regions, and, and so forth. So whether we like it or not, this movie is here to stay. What's the difference between super cloud and multi-cloud? Because multi-cloud, I've, I've been saying, is not necessarily a market yet. Correct, yes. So super cloud is essentially the cloud native uh, capabilities provided by the hyperscalers get you probably 30-40% uh, of the way, right? Uh, but then in order to deliver on a care about, right? In our case, from a cloud networking standpoint, that is experience, that's performance, reliability, zero trust access, and, and so forth, you have to take that a little bit further. And so we have vendors like us that actually build capabilities on top of the hyperscalers, right? Now, even if you think of a single cloud, uh, how you build that is different on AWS than it's on Azure than on GCP. But do the customers care? No, they want to be able to consume it in exactly the same way across all of them. So w whether it's multi-cloud or a single cloud, you have a problem that is white space on top of the hyperscalers capabilities that you just need to build. And what problems is that solving today? Because again, I, again, multi-cloud, I've yet seen the problem. I kind of get what's happening. Multiple clouds do exist, use cases matter, yeah. maybe best to breed, but they're standalone. They're not really correct. interoperating, yeah. so to speak. So people have been successful on, on public cloud. That's correct, yeah. For use cases. A ab absolutely, so even if you take a single cloud, for example, right? Um, you have multiple problems to, to address. So you, let's take the example of I have uh, users coming from various different regions mm -hmm. uh, around the globe, and I have apps that are spread, maybe not across like all clouds, but single cloud, maybe multiple regions, right? Now, I have a reach problem, which is I need to go from where the user is to where the application is sitting. I have an experience problem, because if my spinning wheel shows up, I'm going to go crazy. Mm -hmm. I have a security problem, because I want to make sure it's only me that have access to it, right? But do the cloud providers solve for this entirely? No, they give you the nuts, the bowls, uh, what we call as essentially, what you need is a, is a latte, they give you really nice coffee beans, not just one flavor, 20 flavors of mm -hmm. those, give you raw sugar and a few other things, they give you five different flavors of milk, but you got to make your own latte. So, and this, so that's this what is we where do. the infrastructure transformations happen. Exactly. And the super pass layers, Dave Vellante and I have talked about in, in cloud, is you have to integrate a native cloud, Correct. which is beautiful. It's integrated, yep. everything works together. There's a lot of lattes to be made or espressos. Exactly. I mean, tons of great things there. So. Big check marks, double check, gold star for AWS. Correct. All good. Now, on premises, we found that hybrid is a steady state. Exactly. Okay, that's cloud operations. Now you got the edge. Where does the super cloud strategy come in? For the folks watching there, it's like, hey, okay, I get that. But I don't want to just buy into another vendor's hype. Absolutely. I got to build my own cloud, to your point about the lattes. Correct. They have to make their own infrastructure and application environment to power the developers. Exactly, and, and hybrid is here to stay, as, as you pointed out, uh, right, John? So uh, I have my data center, and let's say when most folks start out, they start with like a single region of a single cloud, right? And what are you most concerned about there? Uh, hey, can I migrate? Can I start to build applications in, in the public cloud, right? And all you care about is, can it talk back into my data center? Like, as long as some basic hygiene is there, that's all they care about, right? The problem happens when you go from kind of the first five EC2 instances to 50 to 100, then you have a few other things that you need to care about, right? That's really kind of where the 
the super cloud capabilities start to come in, right? Because you have the cloud native things, you can make that work for the first few days, mm -hmm. but then after that, you need augmented capabilities. So Ramesh, um, some people will say, hey John, super cloud, okay, it's funny, ha ha ha. <laughs> but isn't it just SaaS? No, SaaS is a delivery mechanism, right? And so, uh, so there is the capability and that is how do you want to consume, right? And so capabilities are cloud native, capabilities are piece of software, capabilities are Kubernetes, uh, cluster form factor, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. How do you want to consume? Maybe it's a packaged form factor, it is a, a SaaS, it could even be PaaS if it's sitting in the in the element and, and so forth, right? And so you really want to distinguish those two. Um, and, and, and that's how we see the, the industry evolve. Can super clouds be specialty clouds? Like is Snowflake a super cloud? Is Goldman Sachs financial cloud a super cloud? A absolutely, right? So super cloud is not like a, a conglomeration of multiple capabilities, right? It can be for a specific use case. It can be for a specific functionality. So we we consider our capabilities uh, by the definition as a super cloud in, in networking, right? Yeah. In cloud networking in, in, in Prosimo. Uh, so does that solve the entirety of what I want to do in the cloud? No, absolutely not. There's data, there's compute, there's a whole bunch of other things, but for a specialty, you do have some super cloud. Yeah, in fact, I had a note here. I was going to ask you, um, will when will there be specialty cloud? clouds, apps, identity data, security, networking, we will see those. Absolutely, yeah, and, and they, those are slowly starting to brew, right? So you have you have identity as one, you have networking as one, you have the zero trust piece as, as another one, you have uh, data as, as another one. So when all these things come together, uh, mm -hmm. absolutely, that's what, that's what the enterprise customers care about. So I love infrastructure as code, that drove a lot of the evolution and revolution of DevOps. When are we going to see security as code and network as code? Or so, is it there? Uh, no, network as code for sure. It's already it's already there. Um, it's probably in its early innings, I would say. Uh, but we are starting to see that already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the reason for that is really simple. Uh, enough CIOs have yelled at their networking teams to say, "My app guys can get this done three, four times a day. You get this done once a week, right?" And so uh, that has actually driven They're quite slow. a bit of innovation. It's slow. slow, right? And so that's driven quite a bit of innovation. Um, the, it all starts with, "Hey, can I build a Terraform provider and then just integrate it into Terraform?" But it doesn't, it doesn't stop there, right? There's a whole bunch of additional capabilities, day and troubleshooting, a whole bunch of things that need to come together. But I would say network as code has already started to, 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 to take shape. Ramesh, that's a great point about specialty clouds. What about vertical clouds too? Because you got insurance, oil and gas, FinTech, both sides of the stack can have specialty clouds. Absolutely, yeah. So. It, What's driving specialty clouds, right? Um, some of it is compliance, um, mainly because you just have to shard the data, and when you shard the data, the entirety gets uh, get, gets sharded, right? Uh, some of it driven by use case, uh, because some are a little more serverless, service mesh, and intelligence focused. Some are a little more infrastructure focused. So you do see that taking off. Uh, I, I would say we've seen a, a whole lot more kind of on the horizontal side, uh, less on the, on the vertical side, but that's really happening, right? Yeah, and I think that, to me, indicates a super cloud. The fact that the diversity of the application exactly. on the clouds themselves. Someone could be spending, say, Liberty Mutual or Goldman Sachs. They were once spending that as CapEx. Exactly. Now it's OpEx, OpEx, so they become a service provider. So if you have scale with data and expertise, you become a super cloud by default. Exactly. And you don't have to pay for the CapEx, yeah. you're already paying in. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. And that's what Snowflake basically did with data warehouse. That's right, yeah. I mean, they're basically a data warehouse. E exactly. It refactored on the cloud and then go, whoa, Let's go to Azure. Yeah, and, and where does that data reside? Do you ask that question? No, right? You just assume that, hey, irrespective of it's a single cloud or multiple regions, it's there. If it's stretched to multiple clouds, yes, it's just there. But you, you talk about like that. In our Clatterati panel earlier, we talked about how companies are going fast on one native cloud because they don't want to have multiple development yep. teams and, and different ops teams. They go all in, say, mostly AWS wins this, unless it's especially Azure productivity software or SQL database. Go hard in on Amazon get speed and velocity, get that flywheel win, get scale, get value, then go to Azure, provide that same value to that marketplace and other clouds. Then the next dot to connect is, can the customer have the same experience across the clouds? That's where it gets interesting. Exactly. What's your thoughts on Actually, that? Actually, it gets interesting even when they go from a single cloud in a single region to multiple regions, right? And the, and the more spread out the regions are, you have requirements around application performance, application experience, and so forth. So suddenly, the networking conversation starts to become an experience and a performance conversation. The security conversation starts to become a zero trust conversation, mm -hmm. and so forth. And so you, you do see that, that interesting yeah. shift that's happening. Of course, latency that makes matters. It, Exactly, and then that gets worsened by the fact that now you have multiple clouds, multiple yeah. regions, and then. So you get regions, 
clouds. And then you have edge locations now. You mentioned and, and, edge. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this, this is why I think multi-cloud is BS, because this is all coming so fast, yeah. you got to get your super cloud first. Exactly. Then you extend into what it looks like a multi-vendor or multi faceted environment that should be automated by that time. Exactly. So it's evolutionary, we're not yeah. there yet. Exactly. So yeah. you agree no market yet. That's right, yes. So unless unless it's like the super large enterprises where we have seen a really good mix of multiple different clouds are super large enterprises where each business unit is free to choose the cloud of their choice for the application developers because they just like a certain cloud, right? Yeah. And there you find or yourself, negotiations. or negotiations, right? Or and for, so, yeah. Exactly, so there you find yourself in a healthy mix, it's not like your 80, 10, 10, it's, mm -hmm. it's a healthy mix of uh, three different clouds, yeah. right? But vast majority of the enterprises, they have a concerted strategy, I have a primary cloud, because that's where two, two big CEOs <laughs> shake hands and yeah. uh, sign multi-billion dollar deals. Right? It's just so. I was talking with Howie Shu, who's now at Zscaler, former VMware, probably know Howie. He's a legend in the community as well. We were talking about the old days of the data center. You remember that we'll go back to our into our you know historical views of experience. Back when the data center became popular, this was the glass house, yes. mainframes, the mini computers, it became a complex environment. You had to have pretty much a PhD or it's serious like networking or some sort of technical background. And then IT was born. The local area yep. networks, the, the mini computers and the PCs change that dynamic, IT was born, yep. okay? And let's just say it, most IT guys aren't PhDs. Exactly. So what's happened there is democratization and the operations side of that wave. We're kind of going through it now, don't you think, with, it, it, with cloud? Like, you got to be super smart to wrangle the data. I mean, some of the data pipelining stuff is super complex, enter Snowflake. Yeah, absolutely. Enter Databricks. And, and largely depends on the maturity, right? Like, so once you pass a certain scale in the cloud, the care about start to be very different. The care about are, how can I operate this at scale? Because I might have started off with a relatively inefficient infrastructure, right? But now if I start to operate that at scale with like thousands of VPCs and so forth, somebody is looking at an AWS bill there and <laughs> no. going, oh, I, no, 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 we're so not going to do that. To, we're getting to the good part now. So, <laughs> so here's where I wanted to get to, because we're, we're kind of getting there. The proof points of super cloud is, IT-like operations, Correct. easy, yep. not overstaffed, and maybe an SRE model, one yeah, to many. Exactly. What are the proof points do you see that would be evidence that super cloud is working? So, uh, in a well-functional model, where we have seen enterprises take the applications that they care about, and then move that into the public cloud or build it organically, uh, if they have staffed their team, I think a good leading indicator is if they have staffed the team so that there are a bunch of guys who understand what it means for cloud native capabilities. There are a bunch of guys who then put it together and then you look at the care abouts, right? Ultimately, at the end of the day, the go, if, you, if you go higher up in the layers, is it about application experience? Is it about kind of reducing the blast radius of my of my security? Yeah. Is it about my data cleanliness and, and hygiene? You, you don't care about kind of how the pipelining works underneath the covers or how do I put a transit <laughs> gateway and this and that together. No, that's not Really care about you okay. care about kind of the outcomes and, and, and Paul Marich used to at VMware when he was there. You say the hardened top. No one talks about what's in an Intel yeah, processor. Exactly. I mean, it just works. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's what applications you build on top of that Intel processor yeah. that actually makes it more powerful, right? And now. And it's so arm. the first evidence <laughs> I would say is kind of how is the team structured. The second evidence would be kind of what what are the care about for the guys that are building these applications, right? Because even the application developers more than the appli application, they, they care about kind of is it helping? Is it delivering on the experience? Is it being used? the way it's supposed to. And this is so value. Exactly, right? And those are not areas that the cloud providers are solely focused on, right? Like you don't see an AWS or an Azure dashboard show that particular thing for the entirety of the application. They'll tell you for the 80 odd services that you that you use, here's the SLA for each one of these services. And right? that's where the customer has to build it. Exactly, right? Now, does that give you the full picture? No, it doesn't. Somebody has to pull this together. Somebody has to aggregate this together and then make sense as to whether this is working or not, right? So whether you call it super cloud whether you call it kind of the care abouts on top of the cloud native stuff, they're all the same. I'm glad you guys came up with the, with the name for this and I think yeah. it's going to be here to well, stay. Well, thank you for sharing your expertise. You've got a great background in, in this area and you got you're, I think you guys are right on the front wave of this new change. I think a little bit early, but that's good, but don't be too early. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? No, and, and, and that's really important, right, John? So uh, you don't want to be too early. You, don't, you certainly don't want to be too late, but at the same time, the pace at which things are evolving are fast yeah. enough that you, you will see, I think when, if we have this conversation even three months from now, yeah. it might be a very different conversation. Yeah. Right? People uh, want to go fast and they exactly. don't want to get stuck with a vendor. They made a bad choice that slows them down because exactly. they got problems to Correct. solve, things to build. Yeah, exactly. Ramesh, thanks for coming on. SuperCloud 22, we're breaking it all down. We're exposing it out to everyone. We're discussing it. We're going to challenge it. But ultimately, it is a thing. SuperCloud 22, thanks for watching. Wonderful, thanks, John.